Welcome back, friends. Welcome to the third official episode of the Kingdom Recon podcast, a draft show presented by the Kingdom Says uh, podcast. I think we're still just another podcast. I almost said network, and then I feel like we're going to get into some copyright infringement stuff. But <laughs> you don't want to get to uh, riches too soon. Yeah. Hey, we're excited to be back. I am here with my normal uh, two co hosts. Uh, to my left or right to, to my side here is is randy ellenberger uh, at chief of the north not chief in the north but chief of the north uh on twitter we refuse to call it x around here and uh down <laughs> below us is the expert himself josh wingate at josh wingate 302 fellas how are we doing tonight doing well i'm ready good to i have missed a week back. so i'm ready to go yeah, yeah. Garrett, garrett was a good feeling but it's good to have josh yeah back. definitely yeah Listen, Garrett sounded like he Shut almost up, knew what he was talking about. Did a great job. <laughs> yeah, Talked a little bit too much yeah. USC last week, but that's yeah, a little, a little bit too much USC. You gotta let West Coast bias the over there with Garrett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we had a couple. He people knows he's in the wheelhouse, so you got to give him credit. Yeah, a couple couple people wrote in and complained. Speaking of uh, the people writing in and complaining, uh, you know, you guys know if you've listened to the other two episodes, I don't like to beg or plead or or borrow or anything like that for likes and sub subscribe. Wow, subscriptions or comments or anything like that. That's not anything that we want to do, but we do sincerely want this to be an interactive experience. We want it to be a place where you can ask questions. We want it to be a place where we can talk about different prospects that you guys are watching that you're enjoying. So the best way to do that, obviously, is to follow us and, and to comment and to share this with your friends who also love the draft. I know that we are a Chiefs-oriented podcast, but we're going to talk about draft prospects uh, in all kinds of different ways. Um, you know, I think we've we've shared plenty of times before. Josh is actually a Cowboys fan, and we welcome him here, and everybody else is welcome here. Uh, we'd even let the Bengals fans come join the conversation as long as they talk about the draft. <laughs> but we um, we just want to invite you guys again to to yes, show your support, but also to join the conversation. And we'll we'll have some other ways to do that. Uh, you know, kind of coming up, but. One of the best ways to do that right now, we are launching this uh, probably as you're hearing this podcast, hitting your ear holes or watching it on YouTube. Uh, we are launching a separate Twitter handle. Um, it is at Kingdom Recon, and you can find us there. We're going to put all of our draft content um, on that on that page, and we'll have some other uh, places to push some of our media out. I know we had been originally doing it on the Kingdom Says uh, podcast account, but really felt like the best way to kind of separate those two and to have those conversations was to do a separate Twitter account. So now I have even more social media uh, accounts to log into, but I'm happy to have those if we're having the conversations that we want to have. Um, so all of the business out of the way, let's, uh, let's get into the fun stuff. And as we are a new baby podcast in our infancy uh, and we've shared, you know, Kind of our different experiences about the draft and, and what got us excited i thought it would be great to help you guys kind of familiarize yourselves with us and maybe a conversation you guys can have in the comments we're going to talk about our biggest draft misses and our biggest draft hits now none of us are in charge of a uh, professional nfl team yet although you know there might be some openings in cleveland here pretty soon <laughs> and hey we couldn't do worse right uh but we we want to talk about the guys that we were like, oh, that guy's going to be so good, and then he wasn't. Uh, and then some of the guys that we were pounding the table for that nobody else, you know, saw, and, um, or, or whether um, other, however those combinations happen, right? Sometimes it's um, we're doubting a guy when we shouldn't be. So I, um, I don't want to go first on this one. Let's talk about draft misses. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Josh, uh, actually, I won't put you on the spot. I'll, I'll go first. I was about to say, we're going with me yeah. first. Yeah, well, we'll share because Josh knows one of mine very well, which was yeah. uh, Nick Bolton. In fact, Josh saved me a lot of embarrassment because um, I was so down on the Nick Bolton pick. I was like, he's undersized. He's slow. He's, you know, this, they can't cover. Uh, and then Josh was like, no, this kid is good. He's a good football player. I'm like, yeah, but did you see his 40 time? And Josh was like, just wait and watch. And I was like, okay. Do so you I, see I, how I, he's a quarterback on the field and he knows exactly what the quarterback is going to do yeah. immediately? So <laughs> I held all my all my Nick Bolton takes, like some of my yeah. 
some of my peers probably should have and held on to those pretty tightly and did not look as bad as I could have. Yeah. So um, I owe Josh a, a lot of <laughs> for that. Um, but there's there's my first one. So Josh, I'll let you go uh, go next. Since yeah, definitely. Say. First of all, I I am so disappointed that I don't get to root for Nick Bolton every single week because he literally is just <laughs> one of my favorite football players Still of good. all time. Still good. Um, <laughs> but someone I do get to root for that I missed uh, very greatly on. I was going into the draft process. I said I wouldn't even draft him just because of everything that was around him. Uh, One, the -the off-the-field issues that he had going on. And then two, when I watched the film, it looked like he was lost out there. Like he didn't know where to go. Um, And that was Micah Parsons. Um, I absolutely said I would not draft this guy because of those two reasons. Um, Playing a true linebacker position, which I thought he was going to have to do, um, he just looked lost. His read and react just wasn't there. Um, If he could not immediately just run straight and hit somebody. Um, He was lost out there. Um, But luckily he met a guy named Dan Quinn and Dan Quinn knew exactly what to do with him. And he is an absolute freak. And we all acknowledge that. And I was, this is probably the biggest draft blunder of all time because probably the guy that should go number one overall in his draft. I said, I would not even draft him. So (laughs) yeah, (laughs) yeah, Hey, I don't know. There's some, been some other pretty big draft blunders, but and like I said, none of us are in charge of an NFL team, so yeah. probably a good thing. So, Randy, it is your turn to bask in the embarrassment. What do you got for us? Yeah, so you know, going through trying to rack my brain on you know guys that you're sitting here and you kind of you hit on or, or you miss on in different directions, but I, th- I think probably one of the biggest ones that that I missed on um, that turned out to be one of the best defensive players of, of our time right now is, is TJ Watt. Um, I thought he was, you know, riding on big brother's coattails, you know, TJ, not as big, not as strong, not as physical. I thought, I thought he was an undersized defensive end that wasn't going to be able to play, uh, you know, stand up against the run game. Um, but he has literally proved me wrong in every facet of, of his game. Uh, he's turned into one of the best defensive players of the last probably 10 years, I think, in my opinion, Um, a a, a true leader on that Steeler defense. And, and, you know, he's, he's going to be in the running for defensive player of the year until he decides to, to, to hang up his cleats. So um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, you know, definitely one of the guys that, that came up over and over in my mind as I was trying to come up with this list of, of guys that I just didn't think that much of, or wasn't going to pan out that turned out to be, a dude and that's that's exactly what he is uh, he's uh he he has he has he's held up his own uh to big brother's legacy uh for sure and he's he's still playing at an extremely high level so uh tj watt i was wrong i'm man enough to say that uh keep balling out man that's he's 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 a hell of a defensive player yeah tj watt avid listener of the pod so uh <laughs> <laughs> I'll say yeah. I would tell him that too. See, TJ Watt was a weird one for me because it was like, on some level, I knew, um, like, I was like, yeah, like I thought he was gonna be a good football player, but I did not expect he was gonna be as as good as what he is. Um, but it's just there, it, similar to Nick Bolton. It's like you, if you watch, like, watch the tape and didn't really get lost in the testing and the the gym short Olympics and the measurables, like you could see it more, I think more clearly. And so that was, it was, it was an interesting, I, I agree with you on the, the concern about size and strength and all that stuff. And, and um, how he was used in college was a little bit, you know, there was kind of some, like, is he an off ball guy? Is he, you know, the hand in the dirt? Is he an outside linebacker? What do you do with him? Um, and that's part of the, the difficulty in projecting these players. Um, I know I, I mentioned the Nick Bolton one. I want to give you guys one that's, not a Chiefs player because Lord knows there's plenty of those that I've missed on. But um, I one that was a little bit older, but man, I did not get it with uh, Odell Odell Beckham when he was coming out. And I remember seeing him in the top ten or fifteen. I'm like, I've got like a second round. Like this guy is small. I just I didn't see anything special about his game. And then he's out here absolutely nuking people in the NFL. Um, obviously, the last couple of years, injuries and, and age have caught up with him. But um, 
to say he was a, a superstar, you know, caliber player in the NFL is no short of a um, a statement. So I I whiffed big time on that. That would have been one that I probably would have. Uh, I would like that one back because I'm sure there were some other receivers in that draft class that I had stacked way above him that were probably um, probably not guys that we want above him. So um, now that we've convinced everybody that we don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> let's, uh, try to get, let's try to win them back. Uh, so what have been some of your biggest hits, some guys that you feel like um, maybe you knew that they were going to – you thought that they were going to be better than what most people did or um, – you know, you you were pounding the table for him, and it felt like nobody else was on board. So, who who are some guys that you really stand by in your evaluations? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out one of my Huskers, um, Levante David. Yeah, watching that dude just fly around the football field, tackling every single thing uh, at the University of Nebraska in his college days was was uh, was super fun to watch. Um, you know, a lot of people thought he was a little undersized, not strong enough. You know, some of those other things coming into the NFL, but uh, he has come in and and really been the mainstay, uh, staple leader of that Tampa Bay Buccaneer defense. And he's been doing it for a few years now. He used to getting a little bit, a little bit uh, up there in the age, but due to still flying around the football field, sideline to sideline, tackling everything he can find, and uh, that's that's one of those guys that you know wasn't. Wasn't really expected a lot of coming into the NFL, but has really, really solidified himself as, as one of the top defenders of the last, you know, six, eight, ten years. So, um, yeah, proud, I'm proud, proud of my uh, proud of my Husker alum there with uh, Levante David. That was one of my dudes. Yeah. Um, so this is probably the hardest thing for me to remember who I was big on. Um, but I do remember I was really big on Nick Foles. And I feel like through his career, um, you can call it a win for him. He had a successful year or a successful career. Um, I probably would have drafted him late first round um, if if it was me. I just really loved him in Arizona, his deep ball ability. He had a beautiful deep ball uh, when he played in Arizona. Um, and he was your typical pocket passer. He had the size that you're looking for. Um, I was just really big on, on him. Um, some other players that I were I was big on as well, and it comes to that um, Nick Bolton draft, um, Jeremiah Wusu Kormo. I don't know how he fell as far as he did. What did he go third round? Um, I would have taken him in the first round easily. Yeah. Um, so guys like that, Jeremiah Wusu Kormo is tearing it up. Nick Bolton tearing it up, who I was huge on as well, and they. I, both of them would have been first round picks for me and they went beyond the first round. So I would call them wins in my opinion. Yeah. Um, there's a couple guys. I'm just kind of looking back through the last couple of drafts. Cause like we were talking about pre-show, it's hard yeah, it's to hard. like hard. <laughs> the ones that you miss, but nobody wants to walk around going, Oh yeah. I totally called yeah. back. It's like, you know, um, part of just trying to stay humble, but also, uh, and not look like a jerk, but also, you know, the misses stick with you. So I'm just looking at the 2020 class. There's a couple guys in there that I was huge on. So Tristan Wirfs, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, um, who I think they just moved to the left side. Like I watched him at Iowa and I was like, this kid just, he's going to shut it down. Uh, his background as a wrestler and um, just as an athlete, I was like, this is like, if you, in my mind, if you built a offensive tackle in a lab, it's Tristan Wirfs. Um, yeah. now there's, and there's a little bit of old school there. He's maybe not the, not everybody's, cup of tea if you're really mobile but um and then another one and this is the guys at the king on the kingdom says podcast will give me crap for bringing this one up but i was driving the bus on jonathan taylor uh that so year was i yeah, yeah. I, when it came time for our pick uh, i'm bang it was like everyone knew we were going to take a running back i'm banging the table for taylor yeah uh and it was like it does, he's not a he's not a fit he's not this and they took Clyde Edwards Alaire, and everyone's like, "Oh, this is going to be such a." And I just, I, I had, to, I was like, "Okay, I'm trying to talk myself into it, talk myself into it." And then just, you know, ten picks later, <clears throat> and Taylor's been an absolute stud. I know he hasn't had yeah. a chance this year, but like, man, you put him in this Chiefs offense. I don't care about the fit. <laughs> yeah, you make you know, him fit. Just yeah, you make him fit. You make it work. Uh, one of the 
guy from that class that I was huge on that I would have been happy with at 32. Um, again, went kind of just a little bit later. Uh, Antoine Winfield Jr. I thought yes. he just yeah, just yeah. so much fun to to, to watch and um, really thought he was going to be and he has lived up to that. So um, there's a couple other players like I said down that list. I just go okay, yeah, this guy, that guy, um, yeah, and it's just that's some of the, again we have the misses and we those stick with us, but. It's always good to look back and go, yeah, I told you that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I also think that um, a lot of the things that these players have, they're they're smaller, they're not the perfect, they don't have the speed, they don't have the perfect agility, they don't have these perfect numbers around them. That's right. why they start to fall. But what they do have and what people don't account for is, are the intangibles. Uh, yeah. Things that you can't measure um, through a combine, um, a 40-yard dash, these guys have that, like – um, Nick Bolton, who we were talking about, um, mm-hmm. his football intelligence is just off the charts. And yeah. I don't care how small you are. I, I don't care um, how fast you are. If you know what they're going to do before uh, they do, uh, mm-hmm. I don't care. You're like You're going to be a great player as long as you have somewhat of the speed to, to make it in the NFL, somewhat of size, and you don't just get on film washed away. Like you're you're going to be great, and these intangibles are ultimately what are important. I don't care about size. Ultimately, show yeah. me that you have the intangibles, and you have the want to. Right. And I remember uh, Steve Spagnuolo said, I think it was um, during Bolton's maybe his second year, or maybe it was late in his rookie year. He he called Nick one of the smartest football players he's ever been around, and that's that's pretty high praise from a guy who's coached multiple. <laughs> Multiple NFL Hall of Famers, and right? It's evident on film. If you watched his college film, like you know that he mm-hmm. was in, he was basically in the huddle before um, the offense yeah. broke. Like he knew exactly yeah. what they were doing. Yep, and it was yeah, you saw that. Um, so we just talked about a little bit about Clyde and and Jonathan Taylor, and that kind of is a good bridge into our our overall discussion for this episode. We're kind of moving through the positions. Um, you know, our first episode we talked about quarterbacks. Um, this week we're going to talk about running backs, which I think is uh, a pretty relevant conversation in today's NFL because there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about the the position and how you utilize it and, and where you should draft it and uh, how much you should pay. So, um, you know, we, we just mentioned Clyde Edwards-Alaire. I think I, – I don't – I'll say this. I don't know a Chiefs fan who, if you gave him that pick back, would want to go another direction. And even – even may not even want to look at Jonathan Taylor. Um, and, and Josh, I know, you know, your Cowboys took Zeke Elliott, you know, number four yeah. overall uh, in the not too distant past. And, and obviously they've moved on from him, but they gave him a big second contract. So there, there's two, two kind of questions that um, I want to ask you guys. The first one is this, do you take a running back in the first round? Yes. Yeah. I- Absolutely. If you tell me you would not take Bijan in the first round right now, um, you're absolutely crazy. Bijan is a special <laughs> talent, but I do think it needs to be a Bijan type player because I can go into a draft and get an Isaiah Spiller, um, a Brian Robinson also in the third, fourth round. So it has to be that special talent like a Bijan Robinson right. for me to go and get that first. Yeah, he's, he's got to be a dude. He's got to be a game changer. You know, the Christian McCaffrey's of the world, you know. Guys like that, Derrick Henry. I mean, some of those guys are just special, and they can they can transform your offense uh, and, and plug and play as you go. Um, I mean, you you go up and down the the list of of top NFL running backs, and a lot of those guys. I mean, the top tier dudes are first round guys. Like mm-hmm. some of the most explosive guys, you know, toting the rock right now are still first round guys. Now, you know, like like Josh said, you can find guys later in the draft, third, fourth round. You know, we we found Isaiah Pacheco in, in the seventh. Yeah. Um, you can find those dudes, but I think the true the true difference makers. I mean, they still come out of round one, and and overall, like they are still they're they're still a huge key cog in their offensive game plan. You know, in their playbook. You know, a lot of those offenses run through those guys, so. So yeah, I mean, if I'm maybe the days of, of drafting, you know, three, four running backs in the first round are probably gone. But that number one, number two guy, for sure. I mean, they're still first round worthy without without a doubt to me. 
See, this is this cover. This question was harder for me than I thought because I'm a big running back guy, um, and, and we'll we'll talk more about running backs here. And um, you know, I I am pro running back, and I just go how yes, there are a lot of guys who are at the top of the draft or top of the leaderboards who were first rounders, but there's probably just as many who are second and third rounders, right? Now, and some of that's a supply and demand issue, right? If nobody's drafting a running back in the first round, they don't have to go in the first round. But, you know, back in the early 2000s, when everybody was looking for that franchise back, you had, you know, five or six guys going early on. Um, I think that there's a conversation that you have to have about, you know, the wear and tear and the mileage um, on a running back as he's coming into the league, how much you're expecting him to, to tote. And then I think that goes back to the load management, right? Like, how do you, um, you know, Gosh, I mean, I watched the Chiefs run my childhood favorite player, Larry Johnson, into the ground. 416 carries, and the, probably 200 of those were just running straight into the back of a, or straight into the, the teeth of a defense. Um, you know, it's, do you, how do you balance that? And then I think the other part, and it's really easy with any position or any, you know, um, player to look back and go, oh, you could have had this guy, you could have had this guy, you know, hindsight's 20 20. But I think it's the opportunity cost of how much does a running back move the needle, especially if you're a top 10 team, right? Um, but here's what I will I will concede, I think. Um, and I'll use Atlanta as an example. Yes, that's what I was thinking exactly. <laughs> it's because they're the most recent one, right? Yeah. That is a pick that makes sense to me because that's a team that is lacking in offensive identity, is built to run the football, Um and has a has a head coach that you know has a history of doing that pretty successfully um has a young quarterback has you know so has some pieces there um and it makes sense with where they were picking to grab a guy like josh said i'm, I'm a big um B. John robinson fan as well um if you haven't seen the the highlight i think it was from this week week two of his some of the cuts that he made and yeah. had guys on skates just absolutely and did that in college all the time, um, you know, you see, okay, that, that makes sense. And so I think a lot of it, you know, there's some of these conversations, um, you know, we, it kind of depends on the context of the franchise and where they're at. Did it make sense for the Kansas city chiefs to take a running back at 32 coming off a super bowl? Yeah, it actually did. Now they took the wrong one, <laughs> uh, but it made sense, you know, for them, if that pick had worked out, you know, um, if they had landed Jonathan Taylor or even a DeAndre Swift or, or somebody else, you know, with a little bit um, to kind of different skill set, I think that there's a, you know, that that's pick is seen pretty differently. I think the, the biggest thing is an opportunity cost of missing on a running back or the injury concerns. And so, again, we just talked about um, before the show, we were talking about the Dick Chubb injury, which is um, extremely graphic. If for some reason you're not familiar with that, um, we encourage you to avoid it. Don't go Googling it or anything like that, but um, a serious, serious, you know, leg injury to a knee injury to a guy who's been one of the top, if not the top running back in the NFL the past couple seasons. Um, you know, so that, that brings me to the next question is, you know, how much do you pay these guys? Do you pay them a second contract? Do you take, is it a viable strategy to take them? In the, and I've seen this on Twitter from some of the, the armchair DMs. Do you, take them in the first round, get that fifth year option, and then just cut them loose because, you know, you get your, your wear and tear out of them. Is it, is it worth paying a bunch of money to a position that I think uh, has a hard time? Uh, I mean, in any position in the NFL is, is tough to, to stay durable in, right, to stay healthy in. Um, but running backs especially, I mean, they get beat up the most. Can you make that investment in a position or in a player that, you know, is – at, probably at a higher risk of being injured than some of the other positions. Yeah, I do have to clear up. I did miss miss speak earlier. Uh, Derek Henry was a second round pick when I was, you know, yeah, rattling off some running backs there. So my apologies there. But um, when it comes to this, it's it's all situational. I mean, it's it's it is you know about the the wear and tear that some of these guys do do take on. You know, Zeke was was pretty prominent you know, ball carrier in in his first few years at Dallas, you know, that offense ran through him. Um, 
so you look at it you look at it both ways you know did he did he earn the earn the second con- big contract absolutely he did you know he he put up numbers he he was he was the focal point um but you could tell you know after after a few years and in, into that second contract where the wear and tear really did start to get to him you know he wasn't as explosive didn't have the big plays um wasn't as productive um i mean it's it's you can you can really go and you know either way with this with this conversation and this topic, um, but I think some of those some of those guys that really are that focal point of of the offense of the, of your franchise really really do earn that second tr- contract and some of them do play well through it too. But in this day and age where the running back is not necessarily the focal point of a lot of offenses anymore, and you, you can get, you know, some of those higher, you know, good quality running backs later in the draft. It's it's kind of hard to, on the business side of things, justify mm-hmm. putting that putting that big price tag and throwing that big bag of money at a running back for, for that second contract and, and hoping that he does stay healthy and stays productive and, and explosive still. So, um, you know, kind of talking both sides of my mouth on that question, but it's, it's I, I do think it really is situational. It's, it's a it's about the guy. It's it's not a it's not a you know a, a statement that can cover every single prospect or every every guy that's playing in the NFL. So hmm. it's it's you know it's all about your offensive philosophy too. Like how big of a how big of a piece is that is is that dude mm-hmm. in your offense and your scheme and your identity as a football team? So yeah. I think in, in in I guess in the long run, yeah, they they can definitely earn that second contract. I would think I would just maybe be a little bit more weary in how you structure that thing um, and being able to get rid of some of those later years, potentially in that second contract. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Josh, so he brings up, you know, Zeke and um, I'm curious, you know, I don't know what, if you had strong opinions about Ezekiel Elliott as a prospect or um, because I know the the debate in that draft was, was Elliott or Ramsey or Dallas. Um, And I'm sure you had an opinion on that, but I did. um, that opinion aside, how, I mean, that's probably one of the better case scenarios of, of a highly drafted running back in the last decade or so. So how would you, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like, you know, that went well? Do you feel like it would have been better to go with another position, um, especially with how important Elliot was to that offense for a while? So, so give us some insight from, you know, from that side of things. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, First of all, my opinion was go Jalen Ramsey because Dallas needed a cornerback so bad, um, and Jalen Ramsey was that kind of a dude. Um, but yeah, Ezekiel Elliott worked out great. Uh, you couldn't have gone wrong with either one of them, in my opinion. Jalen Ramsey or Ezekiel Elliott, they were both were, were great picks for both teams. But um, Ezekiel Elliott was that identity. He was that safety net for a Dak Prescott who got pushed into a starting role early on and he was that guy that took the pressure off of him and allowed him to progress through his expedited um, learning in the season. Um, The Dallas Cowboys were able to put the load onto Elliott and let Dak go as he needed. And you saw that throughout Dak's career as well. Um, I felt like a lot of um, Dak's, Um, abilities came from him being able to not have that pressure and putting it on Ezekiel Elliott's shoulders. Um, I felt a lot of that came from the quarterback and and the running back can be that best friend to a quarterback. So um, I I do really like, I loved Ezekiel Elliott here. Um, He was a really good player. I do think he deserved that second contract. While it might've been a little steep, I do, do think he played out his contract to what, he needed to, and he um, lived up to it, in my opinion. A lot of people might not think that. Um, he fell off at the end of his career, and it was a sharp fall off. Like he He's washed right now. I don't even know how he has a job in the NFL because he's just done. Um, but what he did over the years for Dallas, he completely earned. Um, mm-hmm. And he did that in a time where Dallas could cut him. He played one extra year where Dallas probably should have cut, been able to cut him. Um, but they did have to pay him a lot of money. I'll take that for the the years that he put in prior. Yeah. Um, but Elliot, I, I if looking back, you can't say anything bad about what he did um, mm-hmm. on this team through the contract that he had. 
Yeah. Um, and to the question, I feel like it, it has to be, you have to look at and set yourself up for success. Um, a lot of, and you have to understand a lot of running backs are saying, Hey, um, I, and me going into my last year, I'm going to hold out. I'm going to request a new deal because I want to want to have that security. Um, mm-hmm. What you need to do as an NFL team is not take a top 100 pick, um, but take a pick outside of that top 100 draft a running back, set yourself up for maybe the future and see if you do have that guy that can take over um, in that last year of a running back sh- contract. And if you do, um, you can move on from that guy and, and you're set up for success that way. But if you take a stab at it, you don't, maybe that's when you say, okay, this guy has been successful for me. Uh, let me move into that um, second contract with this guy because I missed, I took my stab at it. Um, I know what I have here, so let me do that. Um, so you can play the game like that and just try to build through the draft. But then if it doesn't work for you, you have that guy waiting for you to to sign. Yeah. And I, I will say this, um, you know, Kansas City fans have been a little bit spoiled with pre-Patrick, pre-Patrick Mahomes in terms of running backs. You know, there was a whole bunch of them. Um, we went from Reese to Larry to Jamal. Uh, but there were some years in between. Right, I I remember, uh, I think it was one of the years that uh, Jamal was injured, when uh, you know they had uh, a gentleman named Jackie Battle playing running back, oh, yeah. and so I don't want to sit here and it's say like oh you know all running backs are good or all running back we're pro running back but, right. but let's acknowledge yeah. that there are special talents and there are there are difference makers and then there are also guys who I think you just bring in to get the get the job done and I think to put that in the context of like you said like a guy like Ezekiel Elliott or or, you know, a, a Bajan Robinson, or even, you know, in Kansas City, one of the things that happened, you know, as Patrick Mahomes was was taking over, um, even though, like, well, I guess, excuse me, as Alex Smith was taking over and Andy Reid was getting into town, you know, Jamal Charles was at the end of, towards the end of his career, and, and we had um, a stable of guys in Spencer Ware and, and Shark Andrick West, who um, really underrated players, I think, in the, the, the big picture thing. But they were guys that, you know, hardly anybody heard of. I, I honestly, to this day, as much as I, I love Sharkandrick West, I don't think I could tell you what college he went to. Um, <laughs> and I know I only knew Spencer Ware because he went to LSU. So, um, and that's not an I don't mean that as a as a dig at, at Sharkandrick West because he worked hard and, and was so much fun to watch. Um, you know, and, and those were guys well, who... That was a small school, a small... A oh, small, yeah. Like small Texas school. Yeah. Uh, mm. Was it East Texas? I don't know. So, Abilene um, Christian. Yep. Abilene Christian. Yep. Sure, no, that's the first one that pops up when you're making. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I'm not <laughs> him. And, but but those are guys who you know were kind of role players who came in and, and could get the job done, and you could win. You know, you could win with them. We talked about you know last week or two a couple weeks ago about what the floor is. You know, and I, I think with running back, it's a different kind of situation because. It, it depends a lot about where your franchise is at. You know, do you need a running back who's going to be a compliment to a Patrick Mahomes or do you need a running back who's going to help a rookie along, um, you know, or a young quarterback along like what, like what you asked, you know, Ezekiel Elliott do to do with, with Dak. So um, we've talked about a lot of running backs and we've talked about what if <clears throat> one of the things that I um, have subjected Josh and Randy to this week uh much to maybe their protest, but I told them they had to anyways. Um, so a couple of years ago when David Montgomery was still in college at Iowa State, there was a somewhat notorious, um, or at least to me it was notorious, and I thought it was hilarious. It was, a, I believe, an ESPN or a CBS graphic, and it was the um, you know running back Frankenstein, and it was comparing David Montgomery to all these professional football players, and it was just super – uh, just very out of there. I, I should probably pull it up and read it off to you guys, but it was, you know, a little bit generous, I think, to um, to Mr. Montgomery. But that sparked this idea in my head that I wanted to to talk to these guys about, and I think we um, we chewed on this for a while, and so we all kind of had different um, takes. But here here was the criteria: essentially, is we are going to create a running back Frankenstein, each of us. Um, with five categories. Uh, the f- five categories are football IQ, agility, strength, speed, and intangibles. Um, we tried to boil it down to five because that's, you know, 
an easy thing to do. So the intangibles includes things like ball security, pass protection, pass, um, you know, pass catching, route running, all the stuff that you kind of all the extra stuff that goes into the player goes into being a uh, running back. And so, um, just to kind of differentiate, IQ is is more of you know their understanding of, of angles and and kind of their running back vision and. Uh, following their blockers, that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of splitting hair maybe, um, but we felt like we wanted to kind of put the pass game element in a uh, kind of a separate bucket without also losing things that are important like ball security and and pass protection. So those are the five criteria. We said uh, players all the way back to 2020, or excuse me, all the way back to 2000. Uh, any NFL player who was in the league from then to now, which is a pretty broad category, I think um, we'll have some – similar guys or some similar similar approaches but i we haven't compared a lot of notes we talked a little bit pre-show just to make sure we didn't have some of the same guys on on um one or two but we uh we have each created monsters i'm curious which uh which one would win in a steel cage fight to the death um, but we're gonna we're gonna start this off by just talking about football iq and uh, I'm going to let um, – you know what? Let's let Randy go first because, Josh, I feel like I picked on you a lot uh, tonight. <laughs> Randy, who is your choice for the uh, the IQ portion? Yeah, so, I mean, going back to, you know, to 2000 to present, you know, there are – there's a lot of dudes to pick from. Um, but I think when it comes down to guys that that just stood out to me over the test of time throughout that, that span of, of guys that just always seem to be in the right place at the right time, seeing the hole, making the cut, um, being a leader on that football team, being a key cog of that that offensive identity. Um, so with my vision and IQ, uh, I took with Damian Tomlinson. Um, that dude, he, <laughs> he's, he's, he's one of the best of all time. In my um, just because he he was he, that he had a nose for the end zone. He he had everything that you wanted uh, in a running back when it comes to, to being able to, you know, have some patience, let his offensive lineman set up some blocks, have the burst to hit that hole when he needed to um, being able to see that cutback lane in, in their zone run game. Um, you know, they could be running outside zone and it's supposed to hit off, you know, outside shoulder, the tackle, he can put his foot in the ground, get vertical and cut off the, the inside hip of the, of the guard and, oh. and take it to the house. So he was a nightmare. He was smart. Yeah. He was smart. He could see the hole. He knew exactly uh, where to go and what to do when he got there. So um, Tomlinson uh, for that one. Yeah. <laughs> I can kind of see where this is going for Tom. So I, I want to give the caveat of while we could do the 2000, oh. um, I, I just did active players. Um, so with my football IQ, I went with Dalvin cook because I feel like he's always hitting the hole. Well, um, he understands the, the blocking schemes, um, and he understands where, where the hole is and, and what he has to do. Um, Dalvin cook is just, he's a smart dude. And while he isn't the most talented, he's great. Um, I think his football IQ elevates him to the status that he was. Um, so that's why I went with Dalvin Cook for football IQ. Yeah, Randy definitely stole mine. I thought this was going to be the easiest. I thought this was going to be the slam dunk. Uh, it was not. So um, I, hats off to, to LT2, uh, LaDainian Tomlin. And I think the, we probably just both have memories of him absolutely destroying yeah. Kansas City all the time. Um, I want to I wanna throw another name out there just off the top of my head. Um, and Because I was just thinking about this. I almost said – I almost went with Zeke, but I was thinking, you know, not to say that um, Zeke wasn't a, a good football player, but um, one of the things that, you know, when you have high football IQ and you understand how to be a, a good runner and that type of thing, um, one, it is a young man's game, but um, that that is the one element that will help keep you, you know, playing. Uh, this big part of Marcus Allen's game way back when. Um, but that made me think of, you know, you talk about long-term NFL players, the running back position. Uh, and I just, I went, oh yeah, Frank Gore, who played for, you know, probably the, yeah. just about that whole time span. Um, was he really athletic? Yeah. But he was also, you know, doing his job and, and able to, you know, um, make nothing out or make something out of very little from, um, just by knowing the game. So, 
Um, honorable yeah. mention to Frank Gore, but yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's I, I'm with you on that one, Randy. So um, uh, another, just real quick, another honorable mention could have been Arian Foster, uh, lowly oh, um, guy, didn't get drafted high, but he made a huge career for himself just because how smart he was. Um, yeah, he he probably easily could have been um, the option there for football IQ. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Next category is agility, and uh, we'll go to Josh. We'll let him lead off on this. I mean, one. as yeah, as an active one, um, I, I don't want to like steal anyone's, but um, for a non-active one, easily could have been Lashawn McCoy because that guy's agility was just unreal. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop talking now. I don't, hold uh, on. How? Do you wait till I forget how to mute you? You just wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, my guy, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't going to do that with uh, the football IQ, but then I did it with agility, thinking that I already knew who everyone's was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I went Christian McCaffrey <laughs> because um, the kid can cut on a dime, um, make you miss. Um, he had. I don't think he has power to his game, but the way he makes you um, just miss – just by mm-hmm. cutting on a dime as well. Um, he's he's just unreal in his agility. As an active um, NFL running back, it's just one of the best. Yeah, I'm a huge uh, Christian Caffrey fan. <laughs> I'm a, I, Randy, I'm going to talk so you don't steal. I'm just, hold on, I'm going to go. I'll get you in a minute. Normally I let you guys go first, but uh, no, mine was LaShawn McCoy for agility. Um, I think that he had a special ability to cut. And uh, I'll even, Josh, I'll even one up you. I know this is kind of cheating because he's only two weeks in but we talked about him earlier in the show you know Bajan robinson yeah. i think probably is gonna be the guy we, we yeah we look i mean that that was my my pro comp um i think Bajan robinson is very similar to Lashawn mccoy but didn't, doesn't carry the ball like it's a loaf of bread um yeah, <laughs> yeah randy i could man i could feel randy's blood pressure going up just thinking of just bringing that up um yeah, yeah. no i John McCoy is a great example of, of agility and then those right. cuts. All right, Randy, tell me you made somebody else. <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, I went Marshall Falk. Oh, okay. Good choice. One of the all time greats. Um, what, you know, after we started going through and, and you were talking about this and just going back and just watching some Marshall Falk highlights, that guy was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the my 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 initial thought going to agility, you know, everyone goes to Barry Sanders. There's there's no one that's ever going to top Barry Sanders when it comes to agility in my mind. Uh, but Barry didn't fit the, uh, the the timeline criteria, and Marshall Falk to me was was the absolute the next best guy. Um, mm-hmm. What he can do in space to make guys just look downright silly as a professional athlete was it was it was pretty unrivaled um, in in this time frame. So. Uh, I could have used Marshall Falcon in, in a couple couple different areas. He was he was my you know one one and B to my one A for Ladanian Tomlinson for vision and IQ. Marshall Falk could have definitely got um, mm-hmm. to that point in my mind, and, and he could have fit in a different in a different category as well. So, um, but Marshall Falk I think was one of the absolute um, best all around pure running backs from from any kind of intangible that you could think of. But uh, he really stood out in agility to me what he could do mm-hmm. together base yeah um yeah marshall was one that was on my list for a couple different spots <laughs> well again another one of those all-time greats yeah um i'm gonna go next i'm gonna go first on this next one just so <laughs> nobody can steal my guy uh it was strength and uh so the next category is strength um i know there's a couple of names that are probably come to mind but i'm gonna go um, not all the way back but a little bit ways back and i'm gonna go with adrian peterson um there was, um, there was just a, the style to his game was when he got going, um, was just so violent and so physical. And I don't know if you would call him, you know, if you're talking about weight room or whatever, maybe not the most, I mean, the dude was built, don't get me wrong, but in terms of like that functional strength, power running, um, now he had a lot of other parts of his game that were, that were good, mm-hmm. but I think, um, he was one of my, my favorite players to watch, you know, kind of growing up um, because he just would pummel people. <laughs> and there you watch some of his, his clips. Um, you know, they, there are, um, 
some runs in there that are just very physical. And so um, I went with Adrian Peterson, also kind of expecting some other names to be uh, already stolen. So we're going to go back to Josh, and we'll we'll let Josh go. Um, yeah, so um, outside – no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to name anyone that's not on my list. Um, so my strength is just going to be Nick Chubb. Um, if you, he's not going to be the guy that you think breaks tackles like crazy. While he can break tackles, he's just – he's solid. Um, and while he does have knee issues out for the year this year, um, the guy can can squat, I think, 800 pounds, I think it was. Was was that what he squatted? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah. He was is just unreal. He, he's – Strong, and he's another one of the guys, as we were talking about earlier, I didn't think he was going to work out in the NFL because, one, he was slow, um, all this. But I, I, I think just being the, the specimen that he is and having the strength that he does uh, makes up for that speed and um, his inability to cut. Um, he, he's, he's special. And as a Georgia fan, like, oh, he's good. <laughs> yeah. Georgia's got some good running backs. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they they got a good run. Yeah. All right, Randy, who do you got for us? Yeah, so, I mean, Adrian Peterson was very close to the top of my list there as well. So, we were, I think we're, we're thinking very similarly here. That's but why the, I went first. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as of right now, when it comes to just pure size and brute strength, I mean, King Henry is, is, is the staple. Um, what that guy can do at his size, as fast as he is, as big and strong as, like, I, there, there. I think there are few in the history of the NFL that can rival his just ferocious style of running and way he can just basically be a human battering ram and just off you go. Mm-hmm. You know, some of some of the big runners and and you know hard runners that you think of in the past, like you know Mike Allstott and you know guys that can just run straight through you. You know Christian Okoye, you know the Nigerian nightmare for us. Big strong dudes that were maybe just a little bit bigger um, than a lot of their defensive players at that time uh, in the game, but right now I don't think there's anybody better um, than than Derrick Henry when it comes to just brute strength and running the football with with just straight power. Yeah, more <clears throat> guys off the off the turf. Um, interesting that I I don't think we I mean Jerome Bettis was a name that I thought maybe might sneak in here, but that's a yeah. tough one. He's yeah, just big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Two other guys I'm going to throw out there just because I want to give them honorable mention. Um, you know, we've talked about a lot of big guys, um, but a player who I think for his size, like you talk about pound for pound strength, uh, Maurice Jones Drew and his and his heyday, like that that man was like literally a bowling ball. Say Austin Eckler too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and then um, one other, maybe this one of those guys is just. NFL trivia I've done in the year, but uh, possibly the greatest two-yard run um, in NFL history, uh, Marion Barber. Uh, just, yeah, I think he broke like six tackles on that one play to get out yeah. of the end zone. And yeah, Marshawn Lynch. Well. Marshawn Lynch, yeah, he was baby Long, baby Long, Lynch. Long, yeah. yeah. Marion Barber was. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. all right. Next one, uh, very important one for running backs, the one that everybody wants to know, the, the sexy, sexy pick. Uh, speed. Let's talk about fast guys. So, Josh, actually, Josh, you went first last time. Randy, I let's hear who you got. Um, uh, I went back and forth, kind of with a with a couple a uh, couple of guys that played at the exact same time. Um, but Jamal Charles is my guy, and you know, maybe it's the homer pick that kind of gave it to gave it to Charles over Chris Johnson was the other guy I was thinking of. Um, you know, being a Chiefs fan, watching Jamal in his heyday. Dude was just lightning fast. I mean, Olympic Olympic speed sprinter, but he as soon as he found a crease and he hit that, I mean, there not there's nobody on that football field that that could catch him. Um, you know, watching, I, I still remember just what I think it was like a 95 yard run or a 90 yard run against the Saints. Uh, mm-hmm. He went outside, made one cut, got vertical, and off to the races, and and it was just gone. So, um, I think Jamal Charles is one of the most underrated. Uh, running backs of his time. I mean, you, you don't often hear his his name put up there with some of the some of the other top runners of his time there. So, I mean, averaging five point four yards a carry, but when it came to, to just sheer speed, um, Jamal's my dude. 
Yeah. I, Jamal was a guy that immediately came to the top of my list. Um, and we talked a little bit before the show about the difference between like just speed and like football speed, you know, pad speed. Um, but I think the way that he used his speed as a runner uh, was special. And yeah. um, again, maybe, I mean, could beat probably 99% of the human race in a foot race. Um, but, you know, the 1%, he doesn't have to be that, that fastest man alive, but uh, he would press you vertically. I think of uh, there's a play against Denver. Um, I think it was the, uh, gosh, it was one of those. And, and he was on some bad teams. And then you knew that he was going to get the ball. Um, he, he gets through to the second level and he's just so fast. The linebacker doesn't even know how to position himself. And he just, you know, Jamal makes just a slight movement and it's gone. So um, I'm going to jump on because I'm already talking here. I'm going to go. Um, so I speed was tough because it's like we're in the modern. Um, we talk about the value of running backs. We have some of the freakiest athletes at running back in the NFL right now that we've had maybe ever. Mm -hmm. And so I went and this is a guy who probably could have I could have picked for two or three other spots on this on these lists. Um, but I was with uh, Saquon Barkley. Um, really good time speed, but you see it on the, on the film, same thing. He uses that speed to, to press vertically. Um, you know, it's, it's maybe not the most, uh, you know, prominent attribute of his game, but it is a, a big attribute of what had made him, um, such a special player early on in his career, obviously injuries and some other stuff are going on. But, um, you know, I think that his, his combination of things, but yeah, he, He's got the football speed, the pad speed that you want. Um, and that will be the transition to Josh. We'll let him uh, tell us his, because I think his is maybe my favorite pick of this yeah, list. Yeah, so um, I I wanted to look at functional speed rather than looking at a 40-yard um, dash because we're, we're talking about the best football players. So if I'm looking at speed, I want to see it done on the field rather than on a track. And that's why I went with Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor – um, in next gen stats has multiple 22 mile per hour runs in his career. Um, so I, I just think Jonathan Taylor as a running back as a whole is, is amazing. Um, but his speed, um, on the field itself is, is just next level. Um, I do want to give like another guy and we mentioned it off the air, but Raheem Mostert is someone that's undervalued for his speed on the field. Um, mm. he like, I easily could have just said, okay, no, no Jonathan Taylor, Raheem Mostert. Um, at one point, I think three years, three or four years ago, um, his next gen speed was 23 miles per hour. Yeah. Um, so, I don't think anybody's really touched that since. Yeah, he's unreal. <laughs> so he has the second fastest this year um, off of last week's uh, 43 yard rushing touchdown where he hit 21.62 miles per hour. Yeah. It's unreal. We're. We have some real athletic freaks in the NFL. I'm barely um, running five miles right. per hour if I run yeah. run on the street with the Ooh. little sign up there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, last category, and I'm I'm gonna go last on this one because I know neither of you have stolen mm -hmm. this one from me. If so, I'm gonna walk off the show. Uh, intangibles. So this covers all the extra stuff. So the pass protection, uh, pat, you know, uh, value in the receiving game, ball security, um, all that stuff. So. Um, Randy, why don't, uh, why don't you go? I'm, I'm curious who you picked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so when, yeah, when we talk about intangibles, you know, the ability to, to catch the football, you know, pass protection, ball security, just all those absolutely little things that, that go into the, in, into the running back skill set. Um, I went with priest Holmes. I went back to another Homer pick. Uh, <laughs> he, he literally did all the little things, right? He was not the biggest dude. He was 5'9", what, 200 pounds, was not the fastest guy in the world. Um, mm -hmm. But he did everything right. He could find every little crease. He had a nose for the end zone. He was fantastic at, at catching little dump passes and screens out of the backfield. Um, great at pass protection. The only slight little knock that I that I could have given him is, is sometimes the ball security wasn't fantastic. But it's not like he had a fumbling problem, like he would fumble once maybe twice a season for the amount of carries and touches that he got. I, I can handle that. You know, as, as an old running back coach, I'm like, football is precious. Like you, we don't do anything without it. So you hold on to the football. So um, that was, that was, um, if I could think of only one slight knock uh, to priest, it might've been that, but 
when it comes to all those other little things, um, during, during this stretch of time, he's hugely underrated, um, but incredibly, incredibly productive, um, at doing all those things. So. All right, good. Nobody took my pick. All right, Josh, no honorable mentions. <laughs> so I, I went with a guy outside of my normal here. Um, okay. Just kidding. I just want to get you a little scared. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I, uh, uh, my intangibles is I w- went with the Homer pick too. I went Ezekiel Elliott. Um, he's that. That's probably what made Elliott great. Um, and he he didn't get to use his receiving skills um, in Dallas like he he should have been utilized with. Uh, but he's I, I would put him on par with maybe not on par, but a little bit under Christian McCaffrey as a receiver. He he can catch the ball. Um, and early on in his career, they were throwing the ball to him quite often um he's got hands on him and a lot of his big plays early in his career were were through the passing game but the thing that sets him apart from almost any other running back is his ability to block um he could very easily right now become a a fullback in the nfl and just excel at it he's next level blocker at, at the position just, just don't line him up as at center on some weird end of the game. Yeah, right. Don't do that, please. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Do it in uh, L.A. now, bud. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, um, I'm so glad. I, I think this was one that might uh, might surprise you guys, but I think it'll make sense once we once I say it. So, I went with Darren Sproles. Um, Sneaky pick. Sneaky. Yeah, mostly a role player, but uh, only three career fumbles. Um, kick returner, punt returner, you've got that added versatility. Um, solid in pass protection. Again, not the biggest guy. Uh, obviously an asset as a receiver. Um, I, I just felt like he, uh, as a as a player, he was like, to me, that is the floor of what you need to win with, uh, is Darren Sproles. But also his willingness to play special teams even later in his career um, you know, always was happy to, to work in a complimentary role. Um, I, I think that he just, he's one of those guys, um, I just have a tremendous amount of respect for and, and a tremendous amount of appreciation for the value that he brought to his football teams. Uh, one, because he partially because he, you know, beat us up early in his career, um, with the chargers, but just knowing that he bounced around the league and it was, you know, had staying power, um, you know, I think injuries towards the end of his career kind of caught up with him. But uh, again, willing to play all three, all, all two phases of the game, right? <laughs> that he could. I bet you he probably would have played some defensive snaps if they would have let him. But um, you know, just seemed like a football first guy, um, and really, uh, to me, embodied a lot of those skill sets that you look for. So, um, all right, we had a lot to talk about running backs. We're uh, yeah. hour mark. Just just stick with us a little bit longer. Um, we're going to talk about our, um, not necessarily the best, not even the ones that we've watched the most of, but just, we're just going to give us, give you guys three running backs, uh, in college right now that may or may not declare that they're more likely going to be, you know, in the draft, uh, come this spring, but just three guys that we're excited to watch about and to watch. So, um, we'll, we'll speak a little bit about each guy or maybe we like I know I've got one guy who I was like, all right, we're kind of scrambling beforehand. I was like, all right, this guy looks fun. Um, you know, <laughs> so in the, the college season, this running back class is, is an interesting one. It's always a, a, a interesting one to – an interesting position to watch, again, as the values kind of change with the league. So, um, you know what? I am going to go first because I don't want to go last because we'll probably end up taking us out of here. So, uh, real quick, you guys know that I'm a big fan of Donovan Edwards um, out of Michigan. We talked about him a couple weeks ago. Uh, I just think that he has uh, kind of some of those intangible skills that we talked about, right? That uh, football player, I think he's going to fit well. Uh, another player, uh, Raheem Rocket Sanders, other than having one of the best nicknames uh, for a running back, uh, uh, just a big bruising style running back. He's got some vision issues. He's got some this and that. I, I don't even know how good he'll be as a pro. But man, he's fun to watch. <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, hope he cleans some of those things up. We could watch people, watch him run over people um, in the pros. So he's one I'm keeping my eye on. Um, and the one I mentioned, like I said, I haven't even watched a whole lot of him, but I'm, I literally I have the tab open uh, watching him against um, 
Alabama last year is, is Mississippi State running back uh, Jaquavius Marks, um, who won, has an excellent number selection, wearing number seven, uh, running backs wearing number seven, automatically get uh, two style points, two extra style points in my book. Um, but so far I've, I've watched him and just a little bit of him and I've enjoyed um, just initially kind of watching his vision as a ball carrier. Um, he sees the holes and hits them pretty quick, which is really important when you're playing Alabama. And it uh, looks like he's off to a solid start this year. So those are three guys to kind of keep an eye on, or at least I'm keeping an eye on. Um, I'm trying to think who we've been taking turns all show. Uh, quick rock, paper, scissors. Let's see who goes next. Or, I mean, I'm a master at it, so I'll just win. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I've talked about him before, but um, we got to see him last week for the first time this year and it's Dejon Edwards, Georgia. Um, I think he's someone that you have to watch. Um, Georgia struggled early on this season running the ball. And then he came in and just took, took the lead and just ran the ball down. Um, I can't even think who we played last week. Uh, South Carolina starts. Um, so Dejon Edwards is going to be someone fun to watch in this draft process. He's a senior. Um, so make sure to keep an eye on him at Georgia. Um, and then, um, just as Tom said, um, I had a guy, um, I was going to talk about Trey Siggers and then, um, I started looking up his stats because I, I remember watching him in last year's draft process. And I, mm-hmm. I just, I loved his explosiveness, explosiveness, his ability in the past game. Um, but then I see he's in, I uh, incarnation, the something. incarnate word. Yeah, yeah word. incarnate word. And I'm like, okay, I'm not talking about this guy because he's back to um, high school. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I threw up, uh, we were trying to find some guys and Blake Watson was a guy I mentioned threw on some tape of his and he reminds you exactly of a Memphis running back. Um, Antonio Gibson, while he's not a great NFL player, um, think of it in the mold of what he can do runner, really good receiver, Tony Pollard, same mold. Um, Blake Watson's that same, same guy. I think he's more in the explosiveness of a Tony Pollard. Um, but, um, he's fun to watch. If you have an opportunity, throw in some film of his, um, because I think the first play I watched, I was like, Oh wow, I like this guy. So make sure to, to keep an eye on him because if you see it, you see it with a running back. Um, you can see that explosiveness. You can see a lot just off of one play. Um, so continue, uh, watch him. And then my little shocker of the day is going to be a running back out of Stanford. And his dad was an all time great, but EJ Smith. Um, so Emmett Smith jr. I think he needs to get more opportunities, um, right now for his career. He's averaging 6.4 yards a carry. Um, he's when he has the ball in his hand, he has the juice, um, that you want in a running back. And his ability to catch the ball and to explode through the hole is is nice. Um, I just want to see him take care of the football a little better. And I think if he starts to do that, you're going to see more opportunities and you're going to see his name more on uh, top 10 plays on ESPN and things of that nature because he is an expos- explosive guy. Um, and he might be better made for the NFL at this this time. So keep an eye out for him. All right. Last but not least, one of those legacy guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, a lot of great running backs and <clears throat> kind of had my, my eye on a few um, who, who finished off, um, you know, last season pretty strong. Uh, first one I'll talk about is I'm going with Braylon Allen out of Wisconsin. Uh, he's a junior, um, just a big, strong dude at, you know, 6'2, 230 pounds. Uh, he's coming off back to back 1,200 yard seasons. Um, you know, he's definitely, he might not have the most shake to him. You know, he's, he's a big, strong, fast dude. He's not the, you know, fastest guy out there. Um, but he'll make people miss in, in a short space and he has no, no problem running you over either. So, um, I think he's, he's, he's got the build to, to withstand, uh, withstand the pounding, um, and to be a workhorse. Um, you know, he started off the season pretty solid. You know, he had a you know big game uh, week one with 140 yards and, and two touchdowns. Granted, that was against Buffalo, not the you know, not a defensive juggernaut. Um, week two, he kind of fell off a little bit, 
Um, and another good, decent game last week, but he's also you know splitting some carries with a senior Ch- uh, Ches Malusi, who's actually having a really good season for Wisconsin right now too. So they got a pretty nice little two-headed uh, monster at running back, and I think that'll probably serve him serve Allen well throughout the course of the season, not having so much wear and tear early. Um, he'll be he'll still have some some fairly fresh legs for for the for the stretch run. Um, one guy that I was that I was you know, another one of these legacy guys, you know, we were talking about Emmett's Emmett Jr. Um, I was looking at Frank Gore Jr. out of Southern Miss this year. Um, he finished the season last year just on an absolute tear, um, you know, with his last two games in the regular season with 178 yards and 199 yards. Um, bowl game against Rice, he went off the charts. Um, 21 carries, 329 yards and two touchdowns. Like he finished the season strong and I was super excited um, to see what he was going to come out doing this year. Uh, so far, he has done jack squat. <laughs> I mean, it is a, it's been a huge letdown so far. I think he's got 76 yards out of three games so far this season. Um, so a little disappointed with that. I know the talent is there. I mean, you know, the legacy we you know is there. Uh, he's got the ability, but uh, for some odd reason so far early this season, it's just not, not turning into a whole lot. Um, Another guy that I was excited for, you know, that's, that finished last um, last season pretty um, on, a, on a good chair. You know, the I was looking at uh, Jawar Jordan out of Louisville. Um, you know, he had a, a great bowl game. It's, this is a guy that doesn't get a lot of carries or a lot of touches, but when he does, he's super explosive and super productive. Uh, bowl game uh, last year, the Fenway Bowl, he was the MVP. He had nine carries for 115 yards and two touchdowns. Um, Right now, he ranks ninth nationally um, in in rushing yards, but he's got seven carries for 96 yards in the first week, seven carries for 135 yards and two touchdowns in week two. Uh, Last week, 18 carries for 113 and a touchdown. So he's averaging 10.8 yards a carry right now. Louisville's 3-0. They're doing something right, but for God's sake, like this kid is electric with the football in his hands. Like Get this kid some more touches. Um, you know, he's, he's caught a few balls out of the backfield, which is, which is nice. Not as many as I kind of expected him to this season, but he's an exciting player to watch. So if you want to, you want to, you know, catch a guy that, you know, is probably not a, if you're not a Louisville fan, but you want to watch an exciting football player, um, check out, uh, Jawar Jordan. So a uh, little honorable mention, a guy that I was high on at the beginning of the season, because you know, that well, kind of how he finished last season, uh, was Anthony Grant with Nebraska, um, Got himself in the doghouse with some academic things with with the new coach, uh, Coach Rule there. Um, big fumble in week one. Didn't even play last week. But Nebraska's top two running backs on their depth chart, um, season-ending injuries last year or last week against uh, Northern Illinois. So maybe there's some uh, redemption for, for Anthony Grant there. You know, he's a 900-yard rusher last year, and I, I figured he'd come in top of the depth chart this year. But hopefully he can uh, – he can get his season back on track and, and help the Huskers get a little bit back on track. But yeah, those are, those are my guys so far. Yeah. So again, it's early in the season. So uh, it's, sometimes it's hard. You always got some breakout guys and you've got some guys who I think this year we've seen some, some guys underperforming. So we'll, we'll certainly have updates uh, to the running back position as we go in terms of the draft pro- draft prospects and, and who's going to be coming and who's going to be going. But uh, listen, it's been, we just went over the hour mark, uh, about to be probably about an hour and 10. So if you stuck with us through all this, we appreciate it. We appreciate your support. Do us a favor, you know, hit the like, subscribe, share all those things that we hate to buy, beg for, but, uh, show your support for the podcast. Tell us who, you, who, uh, who's running back Frankenstein you think would win in a steel cage death match, uh, to the, to the death. I think that's redundant to say in a death match, but uh, maybe if we get enough traction, we could pay somebody to animate that. Uh, it'll be like a celebrity death match. The old, we'll, yeah, the old MTV celebrity. Here we go. Big <laughs> stop action. Now the now our listeners know exactly how old all of us are, yeah. and yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get out of here on that note. Just remember to give us a follow over on the new uh, Twitter handle at Kingdom Recon, and of course the uh, mothership. Uh, show the kingdom says pod uh, that is the handle for well the kingdom says pod so uh thanks again for joining us we will talk to you guys very soon